So when we were forming a team of scholars about our 2020 exhibition, we were asking around about who is doing really great new work on Martin Johnson Heed, and the name on everyone's lips was Maggie Chow. She has done really innovative new thinking on this artist, so we, she's been participating with us in the think tank that our curator, Kate Mancanary, put together of experts on Heed and on eco, the ecological themes that relate to Heed's paintings. Her comments have been fascinating, so we're really eager to hear the rest of it here today. So please welcome Maggie Chow. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here. Um, it's great to be here and to share some of my work with you all on Martin Johnson Heed. I'm looking forward to seeing the show when it goes up um, later this year, and hopefully you'll get a little bit of a preview of some of the themes in the show um, from my talk today. All right, so let's see. Let's begin. And I'd like to begin with an act of sabotage, because, you know, you just got to make the Hudson River School exciting like that. So, sabotage. In 1909, when the New York Herald published a nostalgic story about the old Hudson River School, recounting the heroic exploits of the city's one-time celebrity artists like Frederick Church and Albert Bierstadt, it included a colorful anecdote about the making of this little-known painting, dating from the 1870s, by Church and Bierstadt's contemporary Martin Johnson Heed. The anecdote goes like this. Heed, who occupied Church's room for a while, was painting a sunset, a meadow scene, and left a part of the canvas below the picture. When Heed went out, Church at once finished the lower part. The water from the meadow is leaking down in every direction. The effect was immense. So if we are to believe the author of these reminiscences, who is, by the way, a kind of I looked this up, a military historian turned art enthusiast. Then this painting was the result of a cruel practical joke. While Heed perhaps had every intention of turning this canvas into a marsh scene, like the many that he would paint at this point in his career, the celebrity artist Frederick Church saw something like this, an unfinished canvas, and in Heed's absence ruined his efforts by making a for ma to make a pleasing and valuable picture by adding this in the lower register. And what exactly was that? <laughs> well, it was a makeshift easel made out of whole logs, pouring water that drips down from the canvas onto the floor, and a dancing stick figure with a silly grin, later dubbed in the title, the, the modern title is um, Gremlin in the Studio, but in fact the word gremlin was invented um, much later, so it postdates the painting. It has to do with aviation. So. so you might be wondering, as I did when I read this article, what really happened in Heat's studio back then to account for these strange details? Now, even if you're not an expert in 19th century American painting, you probably would still find these additions rather unusual for the time. And having seen hundreds of 19th century American landscapes myself, I can promise you that this absurdist lower section of the painting is indeed very unprecedented for the period. You may even be reminded of something like the same Rene Magritte's humorous canvases of some 50 years later um, in, in the way he sort of makes, uh, uses the conceit of landscape to turn into a kind of a pictorial joke. Um, and in fact, I've had, I once had this very long debate with another art historian who, who told me, there's no way that's from the 19th century. Maybe like somebody later after his death changed it or something. So um, how do we explain these details then? So let's go over what we know. We know that Church's, or that Heat's painting actually bears no signs of Church's or any other artist's hand. In fact, there is even a second variation of the same composition which would be really hard to believe had it been the result of a singular act of artistic mischief. And both canvases remained in the artist's collection throughout his life before being passed on to descendants. So if sabotage is at play here, then it is certainly Heed's own, an act of artistic self-destruction of sorts that requires explanation. 
That Frederick Church's name would later get associated with the painting is no accident, however. Heed, we know, did occupy Church's New York studio for some time, and there he did often paint marsh scenes like the one in the paintings. Heed was so identified with this subject that he was dubbed by one critic as the New Yorker who paints pretty sunsets over low, flat lowlands. Church, meanwhile, was known for much more imposing, grandiose scenery. Both of these are enormous paintings, completed after the artist made excursions to far corners of the hemisphere, South America on the upper painting, North, northern Canada below. Church was a towering figure of his time. His landscapes were quite the spectacle for 19th century Americans, and his presence loomed large over 1870s New York art. So to unravel our little mystery, we need to trace the intersections of two very dissimilar artistic careers, that of Church, an artist widely recognized as the landscape painter of his generation, and that of the lesser known Heed. And so there's Church, there's Heed, an admirer of Church's work, but also a skeptic about its artistic mission. Martin Johnson Heed's career as an artist began in rural Bucks County, Pennsylvania. A son of farmers, he apprenticed with a local Quaker artist, working as a sign painter and itinerant portraitist when he first started out. In subsequent years, he relocated to small New England enclaves and to frontier boom towns, um, but was constantly plagued um, by failures to establish a profitable studio. As a moderately successful provincial painter with aspirations to become a landscapist, he'd moved to New York City in 1858, renting studio space in the new studio building on 10th Street in New York City, the unofficial headquarters of the well-regarded New York Landscape School, later to be called the Hudson River School. By then, this group of landscapists had become the country's foremost school of painting. It was under Church's leadership that landscape had become much celebrated as an art form both at home and abroad. Church, of course, was building on the legacy of our own Thomas Cole, his teacher and mentor. Cole, as you know, probably know, championed the higher purposefulness of landscape painting in America at a time when the artistic output of this country was considered provincial and second rate compared to the great academic traditions of Europe. Cole famously argued that American terrain however young, was as worthy a setting of historic and legendary narratives as a scenery of the old world, as he demonstrated in his allegorical landscapes, like this one from the series The Course of Empire. Cole inspired a generation of young artists to pursue the genre of landscape, and one of these was Church, who would make a name for himself by adapting his mentor's mission to a growing national taste for naturalism, creating pictures that would imbue observed rather than allegorical scenes with a deep patriotic meaning. The year that he had arrived in New York City, Church's large canvas, Niagara, was making a stop in the city between a recent European tour and an upcoming domestic circuit, displaying the sheer power and sublime beauty of a national landmark that was unrivaled by waterfalls in Europe, the painting would have embodied for, this, for its domestic and foreign audiences the intertwining of nation building and landscape painting. When he saw it, he declared to a friend in a letter that the canvas was the most wonderful picture I ever yet saw. At the 10th Street studio, Heed and Church quickly developed a friendship that would last a lifetime with Church taking the newcomer under his wing, even though Heed was awkwardly slightly older. And in 1866, Heed began to sublet Church's studio. For over a decade, he would work there whenever Church was traveling or at Olana, his estate across the Hudson. Because they shared a workspace, critics regularly associated the two painters Though this, was usually, um, this would usually involve a celebration of church at Heed's expense. So one review of Heed's work began with the fact that they were actually painted in the locality where Mr. Church's pencil brought into the existence the Falls of Niagara. When reporting on an annual open studio event, this illustrated magazine showed Heed's landscapes displayed like little miniatures against Church's oversized easels. <laughs> 
The image is an apt reminder that Heed was constantly overshadowed, literally dwarfed, as in this case, by his more famous colleague. Of course, Heed wasn't the only one working in the shadow of church at that time. There were many friendships and rivalries among landscape painters in the second half of the 19th century. Some artists, like Louis Mignot, would imitate Church's approach, but with more modestly sized canvases for slightly different markets, while some, like Albert Bierstadt, would build lucrative careers by adapting Church's innovations to novel subjects that had not yet been tackled, and in Bierstadt's case, the American West. What remains of Heed and Church's correspondence during these years hints at a complex mentoring relationship. While admiring his more famous colleague, Heed insisted on his originality as a landscapist, a fact that Church, who was liable to call him a flower painter in their letters, seemed a little less inclined to recognize. So what, so I, what we have of the letters is that there's actually a lot of surviving letters from Church to Heed, um, many of them giving advice. Uh, so um, like Church, he'd also traveled to the, to, Amer to the American tropics. So you have a lot of these letters from Church saying like, oh, you have to go here to get the best view and things like that. Um, but there's only one letter that survives from Heed to Church. It dates from 1868, and in it Heed writes, I try the effect of one of your sons just peeping over the horizon. That's the only touch in which I've imitated you and that I did not intend, so don't charge me with stealing your thunder. While I don't know which painting he refers to here, it certainly shows that he was a little bit fed up with his position in the shadows. The dynamic between Church and Heed was also the subject of some private jokes in their artistic circle, so referencing their respective ages and statuses, the illustrator Felix Darley once teased Heed by writing, Sorry to hear that church has gone. Affectionate son did not tell his poppy he was off. So emerging from this complex relationship of both mentorship and camaraderie and, and rivalry are Heed's marsh landscapes, a subject he explored extensively while working out of church's studio amidst the artists, uh, the more famous artists' grand paintings, which Heed actually helped to ship and frame on occasion. So to understand Heath's deep, deep investment in the marsh as a pictorial subject, we need to first recognize how antithetical this subject was to the goals of Church and his followers. So chief among their concerns is what I would call a landscape's narrative potential. That is, the spectator's feeling that when looking at a picture uh, of being in a uh, sort of imaginarily placed in real space that one might be able to step into, pass through, and possess in all its sensory dimensions. And in the words of Asher B. Durand, the founder of the National Academy of Design and the Hudson River School's most prolific theorist of landscape, a landscape should, and I quote um, Durand here, draw you into it so you traverse it, breathe its atmosphere, feel its sunshine, and repose in its shade. So art historians have long recognized that such imagined traversal and occupation enabled 19th century viewers to participate in national narratives of territorial expansion, technological progress, and political domination over indigenous peoples. And nowhere is this trope more visible than in Duran's own 1853 painting, Progress, The Advance of Civilization. Here you see figures moving along a waterside path from foreground to background, um, using various modes of technological transport that get more and more advanced. So there's wagons and boats and trains. And in their movement through this space, their traversal of the space enacts a kind of um, domination over the land. So um, left in the shadows here is a group of Native Americans who are then being removed to reservations while in the distance lies sun -drenched, a sun-drenched frontier ready for conquest and inhabitation. We not only see familiar formulas like this at work in churches' landscapes, but we see them into a kind of more dramatized effect. In his 1853 Heart of the Andes, for instance, 
Beholders are offered a richly detailed foreground that gives way to a series of textured strata in the middle ground and open pathways to distant peaks. Church's improvement on the construction of landscape was the invention of the composite, um, which means a kind of stitching together multiple viewpoints into a single composition like this. In other words, there's not one vantage point in the Andes where you could stand and see this before you. Um, instead, what Church did was he did these very detailed sketches of certain locations as well as um, flora and fauna. And then in his New York studio, he combined all of these into a believable scene. This compositional strategy gave the fiction of traversal even more force. In experiencing this picture, one could come to know or symbolically possess not just a particular prospect or single environment, but the whole of the Andes from the misty jungle lowlands all the way to the bald majestic peaks. And enthusiastic critics indeed boasted that this painting was, and I quote, a complete condensation of South America. When this oversized painting that measures, um, it's taller than me and it's about 10 feet across, um, was exhibited on tour throughout the United States, it attracted tens of thousands of paying visitors who came to view it displayed in a theatrical surround, much as this photograph shows. At each stop, the painting was even accompanied by a printed pamphlet, this right here, that led beholders through descriptions of each part of the scene, from the hamlet in the foreground, to what is called the cataract in its basin in the middle distance, to the snow dome in the background. As if, so if you're reading this pamphlet as you looked at the painting, you might imagine yourself on a kind of guided trek or mule tour or something through a rugged and unexplored wilderness. These virtual travelers were also instructed to bring their opera glasses so that they could get lost in the minutia of all the flora and fauna that was in the foreground, um, just as a naturalist or a collector might do in the field. Key's landscapes, by contrast, display a different set of ambitions. It is not so much that his paintings refuse a kind of imaginary inhabitation by the viewer, because after all, they are very sort of um, richly textured and detailed and atmospherically and botanically, but it was rather that they made light of the endeavor of experiencing landscape as a narrative of progression through space. So while Church's work and exhibition program mythologized the experience of the artist himself who was celebrated at the time for all of his intrepid um, travels through supposedly untrammeled territory, Heed's ambitions are on the surface quite modest. He painted small canvases, so this is really tiny, it's not really a scale comparison. Um, tiny canvases, a mere fraction of Church's hulking giants, and he traveled no further than what was essentially his own backyard, devoting himself to local landscapes that were both familiar and of little note. I want to suggest, though, that such seeming absence of ambition was deliberate, that Heed's paintings worked against the dominant ideology of 19th century landscape, and by extension, what many art historians have seen as the imperialist and ecologically destructive land projects that that genre justified and fueled. So Church may not have been an imperialist himself, but part of the appeal of paintings like Heart of the Andes and the icebergs, which I showed at the beginning, was to unveil those regions of the new world ripe for exploration and development. Indeed, the collectors who ended up purchasing Church's blockbuster canvases, um, often for enormous sums at about um, $10,000, which is a huge amount at the time for painting, often made their fortunes in such industries as railroads and shipping, which benefited and enabled U.S. expansion. What differentiates Heed from not just Church, but indeed most of his landscape painter peers, is subject matter. He chose to paint wetlands, and not just any wetland. Um, and in fact, the term wetland is not used during Heed's lifetime, but was only invented in the 20th century. Um, but a specific kind of coastal landscape 
that was ubiquitous in the eastern United States, the salt marsh, an intertidal zone between land and sea. We may now associate such grassy expanses like these with wildlife refuges and idyllic open space, but during the 1860s and 70s, they were considered wastelands impeding the progress of urban development and therefore a highly unorthodox subject for painting. Cosmopolitan Americans would have viewed such landscapes as marine wastes and plague breeding swamps, the source of unpleasant uh, odors ripe with, rife with miasmic associations. In addition to these bodily dangers, which we know now are due to mosquito-borne illness, um, but at the time was associated with, uh, with the air, marshes were not considered beautiful by any stretch of the imagination. A naturalist writing in 1864 put it simply this way, there are few scenes more dreary and depressing than an extensive salt marsh. Even the marsh's limited usefulness, its production of wild hay annually harvested by local farmers, was understood in sensorially negative terms. One newspaper reporter put it rather graphically this way, Men work mowing, raking, and staking the coarse, rank grass for, with a primitive method and are sometimes caught in treacherous mire. The fragrance is that, was, waste, the fragrance is that wafted from sluggish ditches and stagnant pools choked with decaying vegetation for years. And we shouldn't therefore confuse a scene of haying, like he shows us here, for a kind of classical scene of charming Arcadian labor as nostalgically picturesque as we may look, as it may look to our contemporary eyes. Though adjacent to the eastern seaboard's beaches and rocky cliffs, the marsh is the neglected aesthetic as well as social other of coastal terrain. It is worth noting that Heed actually began his landscape career um, painting the ocean vistas adjacent to the marsh, the site of exclusive resorts and fashionable summer residences. This 1862 seascape of Manchester, Massachusetts would have replicated the prospect enjoyed by wealthy Bostonians who vacationed there and commissioned Heed to paint their prized vistas. Painting the marsh, a landscape associated with the working class, farming communities in the region, thus constitutes both a, a metaphorical and literal turning of one's back to the proper view. As a landscape not worth noticing, let alone exploring, the marsh was antithetical to the narrative priorities of landscape painting. By painting the marsh, the artist chose a terrain already defined by various conditions of impassibility. Marshes are among the few natural terrains that humans cannot cross unaided, and he'd often made reference to that fact. A virtual traveler before Heat's paintings would encounter only obstacles, flooded meadows, brimming streams, soggy ground, into which he would imagine he might sink instead of stand tall. At a very basic level, such pictures work against a viewer's expectations. And they do so by taking part, importantly, in a counter discourse of non-traversability, which grew specifically out of the many failed efforts of the time to turn wetlands into solid earth. The 1860s and 70s marked a major push for wetland reclamation in the United States. Not only on the eastern seaboard where Heed was painting, but also notably in California. Um, this is a moment when the Central Valley, which is a floodplain, becomes transformed into an, an agricultural region, which now produces a vast majority of our produce. Aiming to expand transportation networks and city boundaries and arable land, Mid-19th century developers use unreliable methods for draining and diking northeastern marshes. Um, some of the in industrial efforts to do so are shown in this, um, uh, these prints published in 1867. Their successes were often short-lived because they both lacked a firm understanding of flood management and faced retaliation from the farmers and fishermen that depended on the marsh for their livelihoods. Risky speculation, hindered movement, and an unquestionable foundations came to define marshlands in New England and the Mid-Atlantic during this reclamation boom. While newspapers boasted that vast acreage worth little or nothing 
could converted, be easily converted into lucrative real estate, Reclaim Land constantly reminded its residents of former, its former wetness and its precariousness as a surface for inhabitation. A government report issued in 1886 estimated that some three million acres of coastal marsh along the Atlantic could be transformed into developable terrain, but efforts to exclude the sea until the land had been unsuccessful owing to, as the report noted, failures to see the true conditions of the work. In 1872, Marshfield, Massachusetts, which was the subject of many of Heath's paintings, became the site of the most extensive reclamation experiments yet undertaken in New England. At the cost of $30,000, speculating landholders constructed a dam on the Green Harbor River to keep water out of the surrounding marshes. But by the end, uh, but by the mid 1880s, only a small percentage of the drained land had been, as newspapers reported, brought to tillage, and even that in a very imperfect manner. Sometimes drainage projects had downright dangerous outcomes. A New Hampshire newspaper reported in 1873 that accidents at a local train station built on Salt Marsh had um, become frequent because the solid earth was so scarce um, and it, that it was difficult to drive, unload, and without getting upset. So in Boston, when developers were transforming um, 450 acres of marsh in the Back Bay and the South End into residential neighborhoods, so back here, so Boston was sort of always a marshy landscape, but this was a dramatic transformation. It turned an adjacent basin into a stagnant drainage ditch that presented a huge um, number of environmental problems that went on for decades. This new land uh, was described as smelling like the hold of a ship um, after 30 years voyage by the writer William Dean Howells. And it was not actually, this problem was not fixed until about uh, much later in the 19th century when the landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted corrected this drainage problem by creating, in fact, a marsh, rebuilding the marsh um, to, to, in that landscape, in that site, um, that would utilize daily, the daily flush of the tides to clean out the pollutants. Um, today, that park is called the Fens, but at the time when Olmsted designed it, he actually refused to call it a park at all, um, instead calling it a sanitation project, because, because he recognized that the marsh was not an aesthetic thing for, for, for residents at the time. So what I'm trying to show is that in these period accounts of reclamation gone awry, the, water, the land's watery past was constantly seeping to the surface, revealing the marsh itself as stubbornly resistant to settlement. So for an artist who is skeptical of landscapes enterprising claims, the troubling unstable, unstable conditions of marshland made it a very fitting pictorial subject to sort of explore um, this idea of uh, the skepticism around landscape. Filling canvases with meandering streams and flooded meadows, storm clouds, rain, dampness in general, he depicted marshes that hold on to their aggressive wetness and seem to defy inhabitability. So if convention dictated that landscapes should, as Durand had prescribed to young painters, draw you in, traverse it, to breathe its atmosphere, to remember, rest in its shadows, um, then Heed's marshes are adamantly resistant, reproaching would-be visitors with their soggy foundations and damp atmosphere. Heed's landscapes are not only unorthodox in their subject matter, but also in their defiance of key viewer expectations of how the composition of landscape paintings should look. What surprised viewers about his paintings were that they were nearly empty and uh, formulaically simple in the way that they offered long extended views. Conditioned to see the dramatic and topographically diverse environments created by Church and Durand, 19th century viewers often noted the absence of these qualities in Heath's work. Durand, for instance, had advised painters to compose landscapes that highlight the, quote, elevations and depressions of the world, Earth's surface in an order to avoid what he called monotony. And 
monotony is exactly what critics saw in Heat's paintings. Um, they called attention to things like the painter's quote unquote wearisome horizontal lines. Um, they noted in fa they noted what they they saw mon as monotony of flatness. That's a quote from period um, a critic. Heat's paintings, one critic wrote, was lacking in every feature of grasping after the theatrical and the sensational. And so, of course, those are the very things that had made Church's paintings such a runaway success with American viewers. Yet despite these accusations that he was, you know, weak as to composition and these other things, he'd expressed a lifelong preference for painting, as he put it, where the scenery is perfectly flat. And later in his career, he moved to Florida and would continue to paint the swamps in Florida, which are also flat. The flatness of his chosen subjects often gives Heath paintings the look of a novice's exercise in linear perspective. Like the nodes of a perspective grid, you see his methodically plotted haystacks and streams not so much present a topography of interest, but mark an absence of topography pointing to a kind of flat plane on which their recession into the distance takes place. The horizon, for instance, is almost always in the middle of his compositions, just bisecting the canvas. They may produce an illusion of deep space, but they do so programmatically, bringing attention to the fact that systems of geometric perspectives structure landscape painting on a basic level. Next to Church's paintings, that sort of topographical exoticism of church, a painting like Marshfield Meadows that you see below offers up a kind of landscape in its bare bones, pictorial structure without incident, a landscape absent of those qualities that make it very exciting to traverse or explore. Hayes formulaic spatial layouts are reinforced by his choice of format which I would think of best described as a kind of intimate panorama. His canvases are small, but they're also very long. Um, a landscape orientation stretched to its extremes, and usually they're about twice as long as they are tall. And in this hyper-horizontality, the marsh canvases mimic, though in very miniature form, the circular and moving panoramas of their time. So these were, um, artworks that were grand scale, um, that were kind of entertainment, uh, part of entertainment culture of the time. But these are uh, sort of oversized and popular art forms. Um, and in many ways, they're related to churches, blockbuster canvases, because they allow you to kind of have this experience of space as if you were there. Um, it encourages you to think like, what's it like to inhabit that space, to go into that space? Now, Heed's intimate panoramas, and I'll show you just to give you a sense of scale, elicit a kind of horizontal looking across the foreground rather than into the distance. When coupled with an elongated scan of canvas, their blankness and topographical uniformity de-emphasize background because the foreground is the same as the background. And it, it just kind of repeats. So standing before Heed's marsh scenes, one is likely to feel a strong impulse to get close to see the details, but then to just look across, because it's so wide, you kind of get close and you want to scan. And this mode of looking is, resists a kind of inhabitation of the landscape that the, the large-scale panoramas enabled um, with their immensity and references to kind of um, passage of time and the narrative. So why did he paint something so lowly um, in such an unremarkable manner? Well, what I've been trying to argue here is that the marsh was well aligned with Heed's artistic attitude, his preference for unobtrusive small canvases, and his self-deprecating humor towards painting itself. At the end of this career, he wrote to a lifelong friend in his typical tongue-in-cheek manner that he had, quote, never painted anything worth remembering. But then he added, modesty is a neat thing sometimes, Assume a virtue if you have it not. So I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but his ambiguous remark here recalls a kind of, the same kind of quiet subversiveness that of his paintings. 
which operate under a guise of modesty when set against the grand ambitions of much of landscape painting of the time. In a sense, the self-effacing logic of marsh scenery, the fact that it's a kind of non-aesthetic, banal site, works towards a humbling of landscape painting itself. In picturing the marsh as he does, he was quietly attempting a revision of the genre, one that was liable to turn the entire landscape labor of landscape painting uh, into a joke. Now, Heed's joke on landscape is nowhere more evident than in this painting with which I began. Here, the entire premise of landscape painting as an illusionistic, imaginatively traversable space is turned upon its head. So on the one hand, you might say, the picture seems to celebrate landscape because after all, it calls attention to the genre's illusionism with this humorous conceit of water turning truly fluid. The conceit being, of course, that the landscape painter is so faithful to nature that the paint has come to life. On the other hand, the addition of the sawhorse and this grinning cartoon figure does just the opposite. It suggests that painting is no more believable than it amounts to this kind of child's drawing underneath the canvas. Those details further want us to become aware that the painting isn't quite a landscape at all with the addition of this lower section that's a studio set up, he has actually turned his landscape into a still life. This isn't a painting of a marsh, in other words, it's a painting of a painting. This play with shifting levels of reality may remind you of Trompe l'oeil, the hyper-realistic fool the eye, literally means fool the eye in French, still lives that tricked viewers into confusing painted surfaces for actual material objects. So there is a long tradition in Western painting of trompe l'oeil still life featuring works of art that are positioned upright and close to the viewer, and I'm showing you an 18th century example, but there are many. So Heat's painting is in a classic trompe l'oeil, since um, you're not, you wouldn't, because of the little cartoon section, you're not actually fooled into thinking this is a real thing. Uh, canvas like you would be fooled into thinking that drawing of a cow is a real drawing. But there's good reason that this that Heed's painting replicates this familiar trope of trompe l'oeil because trompe l'oeil itself is a style that relishes in a kind of self-conscious play with the conventions of art. So let me explain what I mean. The philosopher John Baudrillard has actually called trompe l'oeil a kind of anti-painting. Um, it is to painting, he makes this analogy that trompe l'oeil is to painting as an anagram is to literature. So just as the anagram, which is a scrambling of a word's letters to form a new word, is a game-like ritualistic perversion of literary creation, so too trompe l'oeil, he argues, is a parodic simulation of classical still life. So still lifes, so let me just show you in, in this example what I mean. So in a classic still life um, that you have on the right, objects are located on a flat horizontal surface, the tabletop. There is a horizon, there's directional lighting, there's depth of field, um, things behind other things. Trompe l'oeil, on the other hand, which you see on the left, um, is maybe it more, looks more real when you first look at it at first glance, but it actually inverts all the conventions of still life. So there is no horizontality, everything's vertical, there's no weight because these things seem suspended on the wall, there's um, no atmospheric lighting, there's a kind of nebulous lighting. Um, and these eventually show themselves as a kind of sophisticated con. Uh, we are left with objects transformed into weightless surfaces, suspended vertically in a kind of ambiguous time and space. And for Baudrillard, this is a kind of, he characterizes trompe l'oeil as a kind of surreality. So now let me return to Heed. Much of what this painting does is similar to the kind of surreal logic of trompe l'oeil. We might even say that Heed's little painting is a kind of anti-landscape because it perversely restructures that genre's established formulas. By turning his landscape into an object on an easel, 
he shifts our relationship to the artwork from the horizontal to the vertical. Just as in Trempeleau, you had a kind of surface tabletop turned into this vertical wall. And landscape has long been associated with horizontality in the Western tradition, um, because landscapes were imagined uh, always um, since the Renaissance as scenes viewed through a window or from a high prospect. So the scenery is always one that unfolds into depth, a depth that one imagines oneself able to cross. Heat's picture, though, mandates its own verticality. It tells us not to imagine it as a receding horizontal scene, but rather as a very much upright canvas with pigments upon it. On its sawhorse made of logs, any illusion of depth is undone by the unsophisticated drawing below the scene. Heat has also made every effort to connect these two spatial sections of his picture. So recall what I talked about, you know, his, his marsh landscapes being kind of this formulaic display of perspective, right? So he constructs here actually an imagined kind of perspectival grid that enfolds the marsh scene into its surrounding studio space. So if you take the logs down on the bottom there and you imagine extending them into the horizon, then in fact those horizontal, what we call orthogonal lines, which are lines of perspective, would actually meet at the horizon of that embedded picture. Um, a horizon where you might imagine a setting sun to sit. And perhaps this too is gestured by this little impish face just below this canvas as if there's a playful sun that's sunk below the horizon. So it seems there's a kind of unlandscaping at work. The orientation, the reorientation of the painting from horizontal to vertical is, I think, best marked by the leaking water and the growing puddle on the floor. In other words, water can only leak if it's vertical. Taken literally, you might imagine that this isn't about, you know, the conceit of landscape painting being real, but what if this canvas had gotten wet and now it's just set up to drip dry? As funny as that may be, this reorientation is also a kind of apt metaphor for what landscape painting really is as a national endeavor at the time led by church. So landscape painting is a kind of turning of something horizontal into something vertical. In other words, a conversion of terrestrial ground, literal land, into pictorial ground, the picture that hangs. While this painting pokes fun at Heath's own work, you know, self-quotation, it nevertheless carries ample reference to church. In his studio, it was almost certainly painted. So the 1909 Herald account with which I began, of course, names church as one who sabotages uh, Heed's landscape. But what I see at work here is a reverse, actually, a kind of parody at church's expense. The easel, um, the sort of sawhorse easel here, constructed of whole logs, so you can imagine the scale of this would then make this painting huge, right? So that's the kind of oversized pictures that Church actually made. And this water running over the edge of the canvas is a kind of recalling Church's cascades, those little waterfalls that you see in so many of his paintings, like Heart of the Andes. That this parodying of Church's narrative landscapes is performed using the salt marsh is particularly meaningful since wet ground, literal excess water, is what prevents horizontal passage in actual land. I think this painting is really connecting intersecting narratives of drainage. Ecological destruction wrought by the period's wetland reclamation projects um, on the one hand, and a kind of playful undoing or uh, un, un outdoing of one landscape um, one landscape painter by another, on the other hand. So here, Heed's joke on church, or churches on Heed's, if you follow the sort of original le legend, quite literally takes the form of emptying something of its liquidity, water, but also its value, water removed from the marsh on one level of reality and from the canvas on the other. Um, so ecological forms of drainage actually preoccupied Heed visibly in other works from the period as well. 
So in addition to salt marshes, you may know, some of you may know this, he also was well known for painting orchids. Plants popularly believed at the time to be parasitic, even despite the efforts of 19th century botanists to convince the public otherwise. So orchids actually are not parasitic, um, they just use their host plant to physically support them. But the orchid's parasiticism, a kind of drainage of the host plant's nutrients was actually very central to the way that he'd painted them. Um, so here, uh, what you see, um, you see that what's happening in this, in this canvas is that there's this really richly saturated and animated flower that's encircled by bare tree limbs, um, draped with moss. Um, there's a kind of, even the birds are kind of deathly still. So there's, it's a kind of like, as if this is a, also a narrative of drainage of nutrients. So in Heed's marsh paintings, we can imagine a similar, though less visible, um, generation of waste and ruin through drainage. Um, or perhaps kind of imagine that this is what the reclamation is resulted in, that reclamation is going to literally drain the water, but in the process, um, kill life around it. So what I've tried to do today is to trace two parallel narratives. One art historical about landscape painting as a genre and the various artists that, um, that made competing versions of landscape and the other eco-critical about challenges of reclamation, landscape reclamation, that still remain with us today. To bring us up to the present, um, in New York City, for instance, extreme weather events like Hurricane Sandy in 2012 severely damaged those neighborhoods, you can see them in blue, the evacuation zones, those neighborhoods that one time had been tidal marshes. Um, and tidal marshes importantly serve as a natural buffer zone between land and sea. So long denuded of its marshes, New York City is now considering a $119 billion offshore seawall to protect against future extreme weather. So salt marshes destroyed in Heath's time are now leading coastal cities all over the eastern seaboard to consider massive and costly infrastructural defense systems in the face of climate change. Although we now recognize the benefits of coastal marshes, something that Heed's contemporaries were sort of only just beginning to think about, wetlands are still being replaced by pavement at astounding rates on the, eastern, uh, on the Atlantic coast. Aside from the crucial task of providing against storm damage, flooding, and erosion, Salt marshes also help to maintain healthy water and air supplies by storing noxious carbon and filtering nutrients, pollutants, and pathogens from estuaries. The impending loss of marshes, one of the most ecologically productive and diverse ecosystems in the United States, will have a host of negative consequences. Polluted coastal waters, increased storm surge vulnerability, mosquito overpopulation, and loss of habitat for fish, shellfish, and birds. We might wonder, well, when painting salt marshes as aesthetic spaces resistant to development a century and a half ago, was this all something that Martin Johnson Heed already understood? Well, yes and no. Whether Heed was an ecological painter in the full sense of the word is impossible to really answer because it's not a historically sound category for his time. So ecology is a term that emerged right around the time that Heed was painting his marsh landscapes, but the study of environmental interactions that gave birth to the environmental movements um, was much later in the 20th century. That said, Heed had very real concerns about the environment and was vocal about environmentalist causes. So when he retired his sort of Floridian retirement, um, he regularly published articles in a natural history magazine called Forest and Stream, including several that denounced the hunting of exotic birds for their plumage in marshlands in Florida. They're hunting them for the fashion industry. So we may not have a record of what he wrote about the salt marshes he painted in the 1870s, but his paintings suggest 
that he was engaged in a kind of pictorial revisionism inextricably embedded in environmental concerns. With the marsh as his subject, he was exploiting the physical instability of the wetland to visualize cultural instabilities about traversable land and its representation in landscape painting. Heed's interest in questioning the conventions of landscape um, was perhaps a condition of his insecure position within his artistic circle, but in the end, his work recognizes in astute ways the particular incapacity of American landscape painting to uphold its ideological meaning in the face of environmental destruction. At a time when the human control over land and its refashioning was a goal largely reinforced by landscape painters, Heed was on the side of nature, even in its dreary, soggy monotony. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>